So dear colleagues, dear friends of Icarus, thank you for being with us today and welcome to the first Icarus online lecture in the new season. After the summer break, we are together again and we start with our uh, series of uh, events planned for this uh, uh, autumn. Uh, the lecture today is dedicated to the Portal Monasterium, um, uh, which uh, most of you are, uh, I suppose, already familiar with due to the fact that uh, it is the uh, largest, the biggest portal of medieval and early modern charters, as I know, with something like 600,000 or even more uh, charters presented in different levels of procession, for example, with images or some of them also transcriptions and metadata. And of course, also due to the fact that the Monasterium portal is one of the uh, most important products of Icarus community. Uh, it started exactly 20 years ago, I think. And at the beginning, before Icarus as an international association uh, was established, we were a community, an informal community named Monasterium. So it was the first big action of our community. And since that time, one of the pillars of that project is our lecturer for today, Professor Georg Vogeler from the University of Graz. And uh, I'll try to present him shortly. Of course, uh, one can tell uh, uh, many things about Professor Fogeler, but most important is I would say that uh, since 2016, he is a full professor in digital humanities at the University of Graz and the head of the uh, uh, Center for uh, Information Modeling, also at the University of Graz. Uh, his uh, uh, most important fields of uh, research and teaching are uh, digital diplomatic scholarly digital editions. And uh, he has uh, more than uh, 80 publications uh, until now, and he is leading several international projects. And as I told you from the beginnings, he is uh, leading the project Monasterium. And he is going now to present us that project at uh, uh, its per perspectives. So please, Professor Fogeler, the floor is yours, and uh, we are excited to hear your presentation. Thanks, Jaco. Many thanks to all of you for coming and, and listening for, to this event. Um, the, there's, at the beginning, I don't know how fast I should have, because I'm sometimes tempted to be very, very engaged in promoting Monastery, but um, I have to keep in mind that you are a community which already is convinced that monastery is important. Um, uh, still, I will start with um, introducing monastery a bit, uh, contextualizing it, um, and then going to things which monastery is not in the sense it's currently not, um, uh, with, which means that um, I want to tell you a bit what monastery could become. And, and what I do hope that I can support it to become by this European grant money. Um, I got that's why sometimes this from digital to distant diplomatics logo shows up and I'm uh, sometimes talking about um, work which is well um, uh, focused a bit research oriented and uh, whatever. So um, Monastery is something, let's move to the correct folder here, um, uh, which um, in my, when I uh, wrote my press uh, communication for the project, I tried to find this, this catchy keyword and I wrote about fugitive robber barons and heroic deeds and uh, aiding uh, people aiding in, in flight or in religious splittings of families, um, relating them to individual uh, documents, which look much less impressive than they sound, these terms, um, but which are certainly, as a result of the source, documents for this kind of information. So 
left one uh, is a, um, a document um, in a uh, where, um, uh, a, um, a rubber baron, so a knight um, uh, inflicted somebody else, and there was an, uh, a, a, a draw, draw, draw him in front of court, court of law, and then he uh, uh, fled, etc. On the right, you have an uh, dedication of a coat of arms, um, and this coat of arms is usually um, uh, justified by some support to the emperor. Um, by the city in this case, um, uh, uh, to, who got, got this um, uh, this coat of arms, etc. So there is a bit of story behind um, these two even less impressive documents from the visual side. Uh, uh, refer to the um, uh, to the uh, support in flight and um, uh, migration. Um, that's um, in the uh, case uh, of uh, a murderer who fled and then uh, got support, uh, got help. And the right side is a document from the um, from the Reformation where people are split by one person keeping old faith, another one uh, uh, moving to the new faith, faith, and so they had to clarify their the rights is right. So that's something which you find in the monasterium. That's one of the main reasons why uh, we are building monasterium, and many people are using monasterium as a source, as an uh, online available um, resource for historical information, uh, for interesting historical information, etc. And um, on the other hand, um, that's a specific kind of source. Monasterium is dedicated to medieval charters, medieval and early modern charters, and um, uh, sometimes it, uh, this the historical context. Um, I, I was talking the first, um, uh, for the first uh, few slides, first examples uh, is a hiding that there is a community which is, is interested in this type of documents specifically and has some uh, special interest because we know as diplomatists that there are questions behind these documents which are not only the story of something happening but how that is legally uh, transformed how is legal practice locally legal practice etc and we're studying these documents as production of this legal practice of social practice etc so we are interested in charters nothing else um want to see Jaco told already is the largest portal of resource of uh, online portal of this type of documents. Um, and it's large, more than half a million of these documents um, are stored and accessible online from various countries in Europe. Um, and that's why diplomatists, um, in most of the diplomatists know Monastery, are really happy with it and are using it. And um, what you see in this graph is partially my laziness. Um, because this long period between 2018 and 2022, where you don't see any data points, means only that I didn't extract a current number. But in fact, comparing the numbers, you see that these more than 600,000 charters is not really moving fast since 2018. It's not really changing that much. Um, we are well um, uh, more, uh, more than uh, 600,050, uh, 650,000 charters yet, etc. So it's, it's uh, increasing, but it's had, had lost a bit of momentum. Um, that has several reasons. One of the main reasons is that Monastery uh, is not the only institution, it wasn't the only institution anymore with the skills to produce online portals. So archives have uh, created this by themselves. There are lots of digital humanists around to support uh, researchers in doing their own um, um, representations and all databases, et cetera. Um, that's just to keep in mind, that's one of the reasons um, why it's worth thinking about where monetary could and should move towards. Um, another information about monasterium is um, uh, well, from my point of view, interesting as well, as being a diplomatist, it tells a story about um, this research on, um, on medieval charters, um, that this research has a bias 
which is not covered by the numbers of the documents we um, can encounter. Because you see that monastery has a strong, is strong in 14th and 15th century for um, charters, much less strong in the period uh, before and slightly less strong in the period afterward. Monastery, interestingly, is strong on undated stuff, which is undated in the sense that nobody ever engaged in uh, recording the date, although the date is somehow hidden in the data, in the document itself, in the transcriptions, um, in the editions, etc. Um, but um, this period, the 14th, 15th century period, is another reason why I think uh, Monastery could and should move forward, um, because that's the period where you have an amount of documents where classical approaches are uh, applying classical approaches to mathematics is hard. Um, a human reading, transcribing, and taking a, a scholarly edition of a single document takes quite an amount of time to work herself himself through 156,000 charters in the 14th century. Um, so, question is a bit. Um, what um, can we do with this large amount? What is already achieved at Monasterium? And what could be added to Monasterium to um, make it an even better uh, resource for historical research, for diplomatic research? Um, Monasterium in itself is mainly a database. It's just um, a database where people record, um, archive record their um, description on, the, on an image, sometimes only a description, sometimes only an image um, of charters. And you see here a rough overview from which areas these uh, archives come. Um, good amount, that's nice. Um, and, but you realize that many of these areas have their own database. Still, um, Monasterium as a database has some advantages. Um, one I would like to uh, uh, illustrate by an example, um, which is um, yeah, uh, from the scope quite close, but has a context which demonstrates um, where Monasterium um, is heading for somehow by its own momentum. Um, that's an example of um, a research seminar I did with Christoph Egger uh, 2018, um, where we had a small group of students who were interested in uh, documents, and we asked them, okay, let's um, do a, an addition to the, um, so add to the printed volumes of the Cetimento of the uh, papal originals of the uh, 13th century by going to, uh, using Monasterium to record those of the Temple Archives of the Teutonic Order, um, uh, which is um, located in Vienna, which is nice because it was a course in Vienna, and uh, the students could have a look at the originals if they wanted to, but they mostly work with that material in uh, Monasterio. And the Censimento is somehow something similar like Monasterio because it covers um, the production of the papal chancery in the 13th century, um, and uh, uh, sent to all recipients over Europe. Um, but it did this by methods which are feasible to um, a non-digital world. They uh, produced printed volumes describing the papal charters um, from the single um, archive and produced another volume from the next one, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a kind of a database in book form but you never could consult them as a total. Um, with, the, uh, with this experiment in, in this uh, seminar, we, Christoph and me, tried to uh, prove that the description concept of the Censimento could be realized in Monasterium so that the quality of the description is at least similar. Um, but with that, we have uh, by having a large database. The automatic consequence that having in theory started the same thing 50 years ago with monastery we now would have a common database with a common index and could use um, the the all these single efforts as a common result um, with common um, with uh, extracting lots of information about the paper chancery just by having the full production of the paper chancery 
So we created monosteum something which looks like like this, and people who are accustomed with the um, with chintzimento might realize that there's uh, the structure of the chintzimento somehow hidden or a different way um, recorded, but it, everything should be there. So all the the uh, the chantry notes are recorded, which is most important. Reference to to um, uh, important parts of the uh, the the, the initium, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, are there? There is the uh, the, uh, um, the formal description uh, of the um, of the physical uh, features and the, the seal, etc. So that's somehow similar. Looks a bit different, of course, but that proves that the categories are there, and we can do this. What we could do uh, additionally is something what the printed volumes never could. We had had the images additionally. And in the images, we could do annotation of these categories like the chantry notes. And having this, we can extract a list of these notes and um, starting to do what the chantry research would like to do to say, OK, let's try to understand what the uh, how the chantry works by their, their products, by recording who wrote when, what, and, and which position, and what is the function of this, and who are they related, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's something which is new in Monoseo, which is an extension of, um, of uh, the printed approach of the Gensi And um, That is possible because Monoseo is more than just a database. Because Monasterium allows um, the users to add information. So we had the archivists producing the images and raw descriptions, in this case by Tumza and a, a scholar working with these um, uh, charters. And, and now we had the students adding additional um, uh, information um, uh, that the description book fits to the transimental. That's possible because we have this edit mom tool, which has lots of features, which are uh, rather uh, diplomatics uh, driven. Sometimes archivists don't like it because it's just too much. That's fine. Can understand it uh, very well. Um, so we could do all the annotation of people, places, etc., and annotations of um, the the um, of specific of the, the chance we notes, etc. And they could um, even uh, link um, these descriptions to parts. Uh, of the image, so extracting the chancery note here on the lower right um, corner on the top of the pika. Okay, that's something which is an addition, addition in this database, and which is nice, and which uh, is a message to send out. And Monastir um, is more uh, that we could have um, simply by producing uh, archival descriptions, and more that we had uh, with the printed tools. Um, I'm sure that Bartoloni would have be jumped on this opportunity and be really happy if he could have done it uh, 50, 70 years ago already. Um, another example of this um, database, which is different from just producing um, printed calendars um, or archival description, is this project where we recorded, uh, in particular, uh, Martin Roland, Andrea Sajic, and uh, Gabriel Bartz. In Vienna, um, we recorded um, illustrated illustrations, decorated charters, um, which is a completely unique resource. There's no printed uh, reference to this, which uh, could be compared compare to this. And it makes much sense because studying uh, decorations needs images and needs visual features. Um, it's even richer because there is an extensive description of terminology used um, in this, uh, which create a kind of reorganization of this the, the document so that you have on the right side um, uh, um, a, a story told about the, the indulgences um, from Avignon. Um, in where you drag in the data from Monastero, the images and the uh, links to the, the documents themselves. Again, that's something which is simply the database, which is nothing extremely new. It's only something I think we should um, uh, realize that Monastero is able to do. And that is something we should not forget about. Um, so Monastero next is about charters. However, 
Um, in the 20 years since Monoceum came into existence and these two were developed, um, uh, something happened, which is one of the reasons of, um, why, uh, additional reason why maybe um, the impact of Monoceum has slightly slowed down recently. And um, that is that there were many people around creating tools not for diplomatists, but which might be useful for diplomatists. One of the, uh, uh, it is as an example, is the Recogito system created by Anna Simon, uh, a colleague who was very close in connection to the um, ancient history community, and he created tools to uh, create, to um, work on uh, identifying particular places, but persons as well. So do historical semantic annotation um, for of, uh, texts and link them to um, to databases uh, which then could add additional information and link these documents by having set the same identifier. Um, so the Recogito is um, fan, it has a nice interface, easy to use interface to do, to this kind of annotation and it has some functionality where you can automatically um, uh, get, get suggestions on terms of places, uh, what could they be meant with it? I did this with a document from the Alum Corpus um, in uh, so it's a diplomatic Gavenza, um, and to see that um, it uh, identified the place in southern Italy correctly, um, I would say, um, which is nice because the main resources in Recogito are ancient, and in southern Italy, obviously, the tradition is close enough that. Um, uh, in the, this document, I think it's something um, uh, 11th century is referencing the same place. That's there. It's different from Monoceum. It has fun features which Monoceum doesn't have. So I can understand everybody who says, I want to have this kind of, of tool. So let's uh, push my, put my things into Recogito and use that, that um, uh, for my work. Another um, system which is similarly attractive. Um, is uh, the are the Boyan tools, which is a system developed by colleagues in Canada, um, Jeffrey Rockwell and uh, Stephen Sinclair, um, uh, where to uh, do a statistical analysis uh, of a huge, of large text corpora. So you could push in, put in your texts, and um, it would it create some graphics, some statistics, and these uh, word clouds here are an easy, um, colorful way to uh, demonstrate this. There are much more fancy and elaborate things, which are, I think in the end, much more interesting. So you can, can start to study correlations between words. So what what, uh, what kind of, uh, is combined with another word, et cetera. Um, uh, it can easily import everything which is plain text or simple GI text. Um, and um, does this analysis. I did it here with two examples, again, diplomatic uh, and um, and I used a Liber uh, Traditionum from uh, Bavaria, Passau, uh, from the 12th century, so they are temporarily somehow close, these two, and um, even if it might be uh, uninteresting uh, at the beginning for the Southern, uh, Southern Ital uh, Italian colleagues to see this left side, because they would say, come on, of course, ego is important. Who is cares about? It's, it's the typical style. But looking at the right side, you see it's not the typical style if you move across the Alps, because then you have testes, you have the tradition of an object in these kinds of documents. Uh, so the super altare uh, tradited formulation and uh, the, the, the witnesses are the core features in these uh, uh, notitia in uh, north, uh, uh, north of the Alps. So that's another tool which for diplomatists is nice and to produce and uh, we would really recommend it and uh, give it uh, a, a test and uh, uh, it, it test it out. And um, Monastir Net does not provide this. Um, third example, which one of CM does not provide, is the most famous transcribal software. There are other um, tools in development, e transcribos, uh, e transcriptorium in, in Paris, a group uh, building an open source variant of automatic uh, HDR software uh, interfaces. 
Um, so it's a tool where you can um, upload your images, you get a uh, layout analysis, you get a transcription, and you can, can correct this transcription and do some basic annotation on this, um, and then can export it to something. Um, that's, a, again, a really, really nice and fancy tool. Sometimes I'm astonished how bad uh, layout analysis can be with uh, medieval charters. I did not expect this because they are somehow clear cut. But then I realized that uh, there are there is, uh, water dropping in and damaging the charters, et cetera. So there are reasons for that. Anyway, um, that's nice. Again, Monoceum has a transcription tool, of course, but does not do anything automatically in this. So the question for Monoceum next generation is somehow um, what to do with these other uh, methods, tools around which are useful for people interested in charters, um, but not yet in, uh, not part of Monoceum itself. Um, the basic idea is that cooperation wins over competition. Um, so the idea is that we should try to join forces by making Monoceum Next Generation um, more easy to exchange data between these uh, between external services. So, for example, um, uh, allowing an, a user registered in Monasterium to use the same registration for Recogito for, um, uh, for Transcribus, and by this telling, okay, in Monasterium, I find my document, and then I push it through Transcribus, uh, get the automatic transcription, do some uh, uh, correction in, in uh, Transcribus, get it back, and do some fancy diplomatics annotation for the chance event or whatever um, in Monasterium. Um, that's uh, from the user side. Uh, what an approach? What would be nice to have in the new monasterium? From the archivist side, it's somehow similar because archivists can say, "Okay, I publish my stuff on my site. It's nice and it's fine, and everybody knows going to my archive site finds my stuff." But then um, um, there are tools I don't want to provide because it's just too much work, and certainly I cannot provide an service in which the user can merge my data paper charters with the paper charters from another archive that's not my business the business um, uh, it's not my archive so um, uh, allowing the uh, users to uh, move data into monasterium for example uh, linking images directly via triple if um, uh, having references between your archival identifier and the monasterium that identifier that you can add a, a, a link to your website say okay this document you can um, it, uh, um, find on monasterium as well or export to monasterium and then you can use the monasterium tools and um, the monasterium tools and that's the second step why the artificial intelligence came into my the, to the heading of my my presentation here is um, that in the monasterium environment um, features which are interested for people working with medieval charters um, should be more prominent than generic features than generic functionalities basic idea to achieve this kind of um, being part of a set of tools is based uh, on uh, the fifth uh, layer here in the violet area uh, down there um, oh, sorry um, and that is that um, the new generation monasterium will rely as much as possible on a um, uh, technical interface, um, which is well established the RESTful APIs to communicate between web services, between, between services provided on the internet. Um, and by this, trying to uh, communicate to systems like Recogito, to um, uh, Transcribos, or whatever the list down there is. Well, that's the list uh, I created um, when I uh, wrote the proposal. So two years ago, um, it might be slightly different, although most of these are still of interest, but we haven't checked yet now what is really useful in the end. Um, so that's the basic idea, having a monoceum as a database as it is, but link, let him allow it to uh, 
uh, draw, draw in stuff from other services to put uh, monetarium data to other services and get something back that you can then return in your work research environment work. Um, now I put, I put this artificial intelligence in the uh, title. And that's, I think, the major thing we have to tackle in all archival area uh, that uh, how we can use the upcoming um, or the developing methods in um, creating automatically algorithms uh, for human defined tasks uh, that the machine can do it in a sufficient convincing way that it helps human to do something with it, like having a transcription, HDR um, uh, on transcribos or iscriptorium, getting something back which you can control if it's a good transcription, if you like it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that this is something which is not only general like HDR, um, it has been proven by several um, smaller uh, experiments. For example, here, um, a colleague, um, a student of, of Vincent Christlein in Erlangen, uh, did uh, his master's thesis on identifying notarial uh, documents, uh, which in uh, the area north of the Alps are rare, so or less prominent than south of the Alps. So it is a simple, simply a search problem for many uh, researchers. Say, I want to find them. Uh, I want to study no notaries. And um, how do I get to these in, among in this huge collection of uh, archival uh, descriptions? In which archivists usually do, do not much care about if it's a notarial document or not. Um, additionally, to this computer vision approach, to so, uh, just identify them by there is a notarial sign on it. And um, uh, it's um, the adds information on uh, how the document looks like. So you can identify area zones. And by this, we are on the second example um, where uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning methods, have been uh, uh, applied successfully. That's just to say, okay, on this image, there are lots of features. Diplomatists and historians are interested. For example, there's the, the seal, there is the document itself. There are some notes on the back. Uh, some of them are more recent, some are, more, are older. Um, there is a part where there's uh, the, the read text, et cetera. Um, and um, we did here a small experiment with, based on a thousand documents, which uh, uh, Daniel Luga annotated. Um, and then created the YOLO5 uh, model, which is surprisingly really, really good in finding things like seals. Um, uh, and the document itself, it's not that convincing on other uh, tasks, but that's something which, well, it's um, just telling me the direction is good, although uh, it might be, uh, it might need, need some work. And fortunately, I can uh, pay for this work with some. And uh, uh, my collaborators, Angelos and Tamash uh, Kovac, will pop up later. And um, a third example is what we did um, for a conference in Vienna um, a year ago, uh, where we made an experiment if we could classify documents by their visual features, assigning them to the author, to the uh, issuer. Um, and did, doing this with uh, paper documents. First attempt was not that convincing, but a year later um, we uh, improved our algorithms and got some more convincing results. Um, by the way, we got intermediately results like this one on the right side, which is not a paper document, but it has some relationship, visual relationship to the uh, paper documents. So that's uh, something which is even for me, myself, as made my, my diplomatist heart, it's even more interesting because it tells me um, that the uh, these computer vision methods identify features which I might be interested in as well. And I'm currently trying to get more information how this happens and um, et cetera, and uh, how to, to use that. So but these are things to, uh, uh, possible. Uh, third, ex last example, which is not on the visual side, but on the uh, language side, pure language side, we have want to see on that um, significant amount of um, uh, charters only edited uh, in 19th, early 20th century editions um, uh, drawn from uh, the Google corpus and the OCR of the Google corpus is not the best. Um, 
And so there is the simple question, is this good enough? Or would that be rubbish and no deformative could work with it? Um, and um, Thomas Kovac um, did um, a, made an experiment in um, current uh, methods, machine learning based methods um, in correcting the OCR. And you see here, it may be, oh, well, what's this nice thing about online presentations? Most of you can see because it's on your screen. Um, you see the, um, that if you compare the first line and the last line, you realize that there is a significant um, uh, improvement, which comes from uh, the possibility of having a general language model of charters by which um, the, uh, the analysis can um, suggest that at the position of, um, of uh, the uh, 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 terra, uh, per, terra per ecclesiam sample here in the second example in the middle, um, that the per is probably wrong, but something more probable of this position is the word per, and the per bar is probably wrong as well. And the um, suggestion is that in this position, um, very often occurs the term in the word terra. So let's suggest this. Um, so that's another machine learning, um, artificial intelligence based approach, which could help us to get um, uh, text out of in this case printed, but for the HDR, I think the same will hold true. Um, uh, uh, data we have in the database. What we have to keep in mind is that this uh, is not intelligence in the sense that it's something which is dominated by just, um, well, uh, Zickel came around, Mabijan came around and inserted it into my head and by this I know, but it's based on uh, data. Uh, as is our knowledge about diplomatics, it's based on studying the originals, the documents. Um, so we, what we need for any kind of artificial intelligence is um, a hint on what is probably a really diplomatic knowledge. So we need correct classifications. We need uh, some formal representations of the possible uh, text in the charter. So what we need is charters. And that's where Monastir Net um, is in the best position, uh, at least on the side of uh, images of charters. Um, from the text side, uh, Nicola Perrault and the SEMA corpus is uh, very interesting as well. Um, what we need is by this, um, we, we can say the Monastir in this next generation is the source for this kind of training for artificial intelligence. So diplomatic intelligence is um, artificial intelligence can be built, should be built, should we could give it a try to build it on the basis of monastery net of the data there, which has some consequences for monastery net in the next generation. Um, we do need to get a bit out of our Central European bias. Uh, which is nice. It's an interesting area, and there's lots of fancy things to be studied, and etc. cetera. Um, but um, there is a huge gap in France. There is not much data from uh, from, from uh, Great Britain. In fact, there's much data, much more data than here visible, because this includes only the archives. But there is all the data from the uh, the deeds corpus, which uh, uh, Michael Jervis created since the 70s. So transcriptions of 12th and 13th century um, uh, English cartularies uh, is included. Anyway, uh, that's one of the message for the Monastery of the Next Generation. Um, please uh, help us, um, please, um, in, in extending the, the corpus that it re represents the, the real scope of um, uh, medieval, early modern charter production not just stick to this uh, core area of the Icarus consortium. Um, what we have to do as well is a bit dark, and I keep it in the shadow deliberately, um, is there is technologically, Monasterium is getting old. Um, that happens with software, with almost every software, and it's not the interface which is getting old, um, it's the, uh, the backend, 
So the database in the uh, backend is getting old, and there uh, it was. That's the other second argument. It wasn't conceptualized to support um, machine learning approaches. So what we would need is um, refactor this backend and create a new backend, which is a bit more stable and less gray, and um, uh, that supports this kind of uh, access. So people can bulk download uh, a set of images selected by this. Um, which um, needs unique, stable, and unique identifiers. There's one term already very, uh, very well advanced, sometimes much uh, better than some archives, although archives have kept, uh, catched up. And we need a slightly different internalization of the data, which merges data on a single charter uh, together, makes it easier to say, well, that's all data on one charter. And currently, we are working on um, realizing this in a uh, W3C standard uh, way, which has the advantage that we can say it's publicly defined. And so people know how it should work. Um, and by this, uh, it's easier for them to access the stuff and work with it. Link data platform is the basic um, concept, which is um, modeled somehow like a simple directory file system um, combined with metadata in a graph database. So you are really flexible in a description, uh, but you still have your easy access in the, the, the uh, organization of the data. And it adds um, this RESTful API functionalities to interact with the stuff. And um, we certainly have to do things which are nicer to look at. Um, so um, there is lots of geographic information. It would be nice to have a, integrate uh, a simple functionality to just click somewhere and drag this on a name, not only linking uh, visual features with transcriptions, but uh, making it easier to identify places and directly add them to the database. Uh, this map on the right is an example that there is only really progress on this. Thanks to Antonella and her group, um, we have uh, a, a lots of uh, GeoNet references to uh, the documents of Santa Maria de la Grotta in near Naples. Uh, and by this, you can already create a map of the, these. It's the only map. Um, you could do it with all monotheum data, but it's the only map where it's working because it's the only map where we have the data already uh, created by. Um, engaged students. Um, this includes um, a stuff we where there's also something already monastery met, which is um, again so halfway. So creating indices um, in which you can uh, um, display all people, uh, all names of people, of names of persons, and list all the documents uh, in which they occur. Um, is functionally which is there not very often used I assume it's somehow hidden um, but here again it is there and maybe we should uh, do one day an uh, um, introduction to this and um, and here is another uh, example uh, which recently we created that's a um, tool to create uh, control vocabularies and organize them hierarchically at Scott editor um, uh, which is for this glossary style thing you have seen for the um, for the illuminated charters. Uh, functionalities like timers, et cetera, et cetera. But the core point is that the monastery of the next generation should make it easier to interact with these artificial intelligence, machine learning based methods, um, which means that um, we could do, have the same entry point that uh, researchers could just start in monastery as a database start to collect samples they are interested in by whatever search method they like, and then work having their subset of documents they're interested in, pushing it through pipelines, which um, use these machine learning bases to return your suggestion for your research, for your uh, what you are interested in. So move to things where you say, okay, um, I have my set of documents, create something out of it, which is, um, visual representation, how a merged document could look like. And in fact, I'm also already working on this a bit, um, how to merge this so have some annotation and uh, reference them that you can um, get a visual impression uh, how similar um, my set of documents is in a specific visual feature or uh, textual feature. 
Um, the same is true, uh, saying, okay, I have my set set. They have, for me, understandable features. I couldn't describe them in the search, but they are there. So let's push these images to the whole data set of Monasterium and get some suggestions of documents which are by the machine learning engine considered to be similar. If they are really similar, something you as a human will then decide. Well, that's a uh, functionality which would enhance Monasterium and make it a better tool to work and search within and extract information, places, etc., and uh, create a map, a map out of it. It would be another one. You have seen Recogito and stuff like this would be nice to have integrated in Monasterium. And I did not extend this list because the last one already showed it's not necessarily to be done only in Monasterium. Um, crucial would be that this uh, there are services around um, where to which you could push monotherm data or services around where you have an explanation how you can access the monotherm data and use it in this external service that you in the end could then go and work with it and do your own stuff and um, that means if we um monotherm in the next generation and um, is a combination of the knowledge and the information about medieval and early modern charts, which is already in Monasterium. And with these um, existing services around with machine learning methods um, to gather new information about medieval charts, about the content, about historical questions. Um, so it's very strongly based on um, the subject, I think, and that's what where Monasterium is strong on, and where Monasterium has a, a mission to fulfill to be to remain this uh, resource where people interested in medieval and early modern, modern charters can work with it, can extract knowledge from it, and can uh, use it in whatever more generic tool there is out there. Still, the Monasterium is the charter portal, and that's I'm really looking forward. I'm proud that it is. I'm trying to keep it and make it more useful. That's my vision. Thanks. And I'm curious about your questions. Thank you, Georg. Thank you very much for your inspiring and very comprehensive presentation, which gives to all of us an impulse uh, in terms of moving forward and contributing to the portal monasterium. Uh, we learned uh, very much about new possibilities and uh, perspectives of the project, but uh, maybe some of you have questions. I will ask you to raise your hand or uh, or simply uh, speak and turn your mics on, uh, on. I'll write them in the chat. Uh, Daniel. Come okay, on. Daniel. <laughs> Hi. That was a tough question in the beginning. Okay. No, no, I don't have a question. Actually, I have uh, an, an information for you about the undated charters. Many of them are artifacts from the early phases of the monasterium existence. So. They are not actually charters or they are not actually unpublished. Um, it's just that, that the date very often is the 99999 and stuff. So the number, I guess the real unidentified is, is much uh, smaller. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that, that's a good point. They are not unidentified. There is archival reference and uh, the, the document is there. But um, the majority of the documents are uh, from the OCR, from the Google corpus where identifying the date and translating the date was much harder um, than having them in archival databases. That's this unknown date. So they, they are dated, but uh, the machine wasn't able to extract the date from the data we had. That's the point. Um, there is much more um, dated stuff uh, of, uh, in this part, uh, certainly. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. At the moment, I do not see any further hands. Uh, maybe I could uh, 
ask something. Uh, so uh, we heard uh, very much, as I told, about the possibilities and new perspectives of the project. Uh, maybe, Georg, you can tell us something uh, about in which uh, sense or how much uh, those per perspectives are connected maybe with the project uh, from uh, digital to distant diplomatics you are carrying out at the moment at the University of Graz. Yeah, certainly. Um, um, the, uh, even if the perspectives in general are generic, and um, I think most of you share, uh, I only allowed myself to talk about them um, because the project uh, with the project I have funding to promote them. Uh, in the project itself, uh, there is a second strand um, that um, we will try to um, test um, if uh, with this kind of methods and the uh, data set already available in one of them and the data set we Ten, uh, ten, um, we well, uh, European Union got, uh, got gave us money to extend. Um, but uh, if we could um, uh, answer, um, build European-wide knowledge about European developments in the later Middle Ages in uh, in diplomatics, um, uh, testing how much how close language is, how uh, regional and how generic it is, or if, if there are influences of the central institutions um, still uh, uh, trickling down into, uh, uh, um, uh, into local, more local communities uh, and stuff like this. Um, that's uh, the, the project has the second strand as well. So I do hope that diplomatics will profit from this, but um, the, uh, the project itself would well, need is well, it would need lots of functionalities I talked about. So we will apply uh, machine learning methods. So everything where, where it's easier for us to get access by for uh, to monastery that data is uh, a solution which is feasible for us and will be feasible for everybody. And we will, will work on explicitly on modernizing monastery and moving it into a, better, a more up-to-date backend and integrating as much of the visions I expressed here as possible with the money we have. On the other hand, what we don't won't be able is um, having all this um, extending the scope of one is there. Partially we are able because there is money and I'm willing to spend it on more digitized documents. Uh, I'm getting integrating stuff from archives who have already digitized stuff and think okay that feature that's something that would be nice. Um, uh, but um, additionally, everybody who thinks, okay, that's a vision I would like to support. So here is my personal corpus. Here's my archive. Please get in contact. I am looking forward to it. Or get in contact with Carl, uh, because Carl um, is engaged since recently in managing this uh, process in particular. And you know, Carl is a very, very kind person. Um, so um, he might be a lower level to approach than me, but I'm happy. Just contact me, just contact us um, if you want to contribute to one of them. Thank you. Any further questions? Does someone have to add something or comment? Well, I don't see any hands. So if there are no questions or comments, I would like to thank you, uh, everyone, for being with us today at the first uh, online lecture in the new season. Thank you, Georg, very much for the presentation. Maybe we have uh, one or two minutes to announce our next events. Uh, we will have, I think, uh, three online lectures. Yes, Jaco, maybe Carl could uh, say a yeah, few I, words I about these uh, upcoming lectures. Yeah, yeah, I wanted just to ask Carl to, to tell us something uh, shortly about the three lectures uh, lying ahead, dedicated to the project European Digital Treasures. No? Carl. Yes, Jaco.
Uh, thank you very much. So, dear colleagues, um, I want to announce that we start a series of free lectures in the uh, in the end of September, lasting till middle of October. So, on 22nd, uh, 26th of September, 3rd of October, and the 10th of October, dealing with the free exhibitions that were organized by the European project of European Digital Treasures, uh, lasting for by now almost four years, involved uh, carried through by five national and state archives and Icarus and the Irish Technical University in order to, to spread the knowledge about the function of the archives as the keeper of the historical heritage of Europe. And uh, the goal of this series is to give an overview over the past uh, already um, uh, finished uh, exhibitions and the current one, which is still running in St. Pölten in Austria and in several other European countries. So the three topics are the making of Europe, um, migration, flows, exile and solidar solidarity, and the current one, European inventions and um, discoveries. So very vast and very timeless topics, as I think. So within this, these lectures, we try to um, introduce the, each of the, of the exhibitions by uh, explaining and analyzing five or some uh, objects uh, exhibited, contextualize them, uh, give an overview how we try to select the documents, what um, context was important, and how it general was the, uh, the cooperation between very different institutions all over Europe. Uh, these these uh, lectures will be bilingual, that means we will have an English version, version and a German version. So it's up to you which uh, to visit. So we start with the English one, I think at, at uh, four o'clock and, uh, and after one hour we continue with the German one. And the English and German variations will not be exactly the same. So if you are capable to follow both languages, it would be of high interest for you to join all two. Um, uh, versions if uh, your time allows this. 